Welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna, and over there is Kelly. I said, oops, upside your head. I said, oops, upside your head. But Snoops upside your head. Yeah. <laughs> Snoops upside your head. Uh, we're going to go murder the people downstairs, and we're going to make an episode about it because they're fucking singing way too loud. Once we get to letter. And now, a thought from Geico Motorcycle. It took 15 minutes to take a spirit animal quiz online. Please be the cheetah. Please be the cheetah. And learn your animal isn't the cheetah, but the far less appealing blobfish. Oh, come on. To add insult to injury, you could have used those 15 blobfish minutes to switch your motorcycle insurance to Geico. Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on motorcycle insurance. For tea, it's going to be total eclipse of the heart <laughs> because for the last however many minutes... <laughs> There are people downstairs singing Total Eclipse of the Heart repeatedly, and I'm like, keep thinking they're just going to get worn out and stop so we can start recording, but I hope that you can't hear that, but they're still going. Yeah, no, it, it, if it was good, we'd be jamming, but it's... It's not. It's not. No. It's bad stuff. What's can you hear that? that? I gave you my heart. <laughs> so bad. So uh, we apologize if there's background noise, but we've tried waiting it out and they're clearly not losing their stride. So <laughs> <laughs> they're winning at this point. So, so we got to go ahead and record. And we're going to do what we do best and win, win, win. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a competition. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we're going to out podcast them. Yeah. And we have mics. I don't think they have mics. Yeah, exactly. So and well, I'm just going to put on some music and you can just start rapping as hard as you can and you're yes going. oh totally battle <laughs> mom spaghetti <laughs> so before we get started we wanted to remind you to check out our instagram facebook and twitter we've got a bunch of stuff on there and information about new episodes and when new episodes drop what's going on with patreon and uh, merch and all that good stuff so if you want more information about the show definitely check out facebook instagram and twitter the links are going to be in the show notes if you haven't checked out our patreon you can uh, join patreon and have access to bonus episodes and merch that we send out so um, check out patreon that link is also in the show notes i'll send you a lock of my hair just a little bit like just maybe two strands yeah from my head or wherever you prefer just write your preference <laughs> nose <laughs> ear hairs <laughs> she sounds young but she's like an 80 year old man so tons of ear hairs to spare <laughs> So we also have merch available now on Threadless. So that's threadless.com slash murder dictionary. And that link, of course, again, is going to be in the description and show notes. So you could get T-shirts and iPhone cases, mugs, water bottles, stuff like that. I'm going to have like a just a big bin. Mm -hmm. So any I'm, I don't do one night stands, but I'm going to start. And then that's going to be the going away gift, like yeah. departing <laughs> departure. <laughs> <laughs> yes. my vagina. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want access to all of that good stuff mm -hmm. plus merch <laughs> <laughs> plus merch it's gonna be on threadless so you can access that through the show notes and on our social media yeah rep us yeah want... rep murder dictionary yeah. we need you definitely go onto the street corner and scream about us wearing a shirt hold up signs wear the, the shirt like wave your water bottle around yeah and be on the phone with your cool case at the same time you gotta do it all <laughs> It's total branding experience. <laughs> it's a murder dictionary takeover. <laughs> 
So again, those links will all be in the show notes along with some of the links to research used for the story tonight, as well as resources for domestic violence, child protective services, anti-bullying, any mental health resources, stuff like that. So you can find those in the show notes. And I think lastly, you could also find timestamps. So tonight there's going to be, you know, a story, of course, true crime has some violence and some gruesomeness. And tonight there's going to be definitely some violence against women, which can be particularly triggering. So we want to make sure that you know when to skip those parts. So there will be timestamps. It's a major theme in every horror movie, which is appropriate because it's really getting close, isn't it? Yep. Halloween's right around the corner. So close. Which I call my one day off a year. (laughs) Because it's the only time that I look like a normal person (laughs) for the last, like, whatever, 15 years of my life. I've just looked weird. So it's the 364 days a year I get strange looks. And now that's my one day. Cool. Halloween. Everybody else get looked at and I can chill out for a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited. Me too. I want to see what you dress up as. Me. You? Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that costume Me, too. but a little bit more chill. <laughs> <laughs> the pressure's off because kids aren't pointing at me and parents aren't giving me dirty looks and shit like that. Yeah. So I get to just like chill in the cut. Yeah. Be real low key. I'm going to be you falling off a ladder. <laughs> You're never living it down. I'm just going to put every ladder on Halloween. I'm going to hunt down that security footage for you. I'm going to, I'm, that's going to be my Halloween present. Can we post it? Um, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Will it be in our link to Patreon? <laughs> I fucking need it. I am not known for my grace and, uh, you know. Just your style. <laughs> I'm really clumsy, you know. Who are you talking to right now? And I've been super sick, so my balance is off, and you know, I'm I'm getting it back together. But today was a rough day. Yeah. So, um, you know, when the bodies hit the floor, (laughs) some people. What is that quote that a uh, flying is falling with grace? And I'd like to think you were trying to fly. I was really. That's part of my five year plan. (laughs) It's just to learn to fly, just like Harrison Ford. So that was my first attempt at making it happen. Next time it'll be better. Also, someone just told me like 30 seconds before that, they were like, be free, little bird. (laughs) (laughs) And And I was all like, tweet, tweet, (laughs) but I fell over. (laughs) Usually birds don't start flying by jumping backwards. Nope. (laughs) They don't go back first into it. It's not like a swan dive. (laughs) Basically, it looked like I was falling maybe off a skateboard or maybe like into a pool where you're just like, you know, arms kind of out. My arms were out. Yeah, it was fun. (laughs) You shouldn't have ever told me that. Uh, Yeah, yeah, because now the world knows. Thanks. uh, God, what better place to air? (laughs) My secrets. Yeah, yeah, so I'm spazzy. That's fun. Yeah, so um, you almost got murdered on a ladder. Now tell me about murder. More murder. The ladder murder was passed. This is this is the story for tonight. <laughs> there are no ladders involved. Huh. But there are sisters, because we're still on letter S for sisters. And this is the story of the Gonzalez sisters. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. So yeah, like I said, just a warning. It's going to be a, a very heavy story, Barbie. you know? Yeah. Very barf cauldrony. It's going to be rough. But, you know, this is true crime. So sometimes the stories are a little bit easier to make light of. And sometimes they're just heavy, heavy, heavy. So this is one of those good times. As though the last one, <laughs> letter S part two, is pretty <laughs> bad, too. We're just continuing in that theme. We're trying to out heavy each other. Yes. <laughs> Let's do it. What you got? So... Let's see. The Gonzalez Valenzuela family was from Jalisco in a really poor area of Mexico. Uh, Bernadina and Isidro Gonzalez Venezuela struggled to make ends meet. And once they started having children, of course, the situation got worse. So they were already struggling with poverty. And then when they had the girls, they really had trouble, you know, paying the bills and feeding all the kids. See, in America, you get paid to have children. (laughs) Oh, is that how it works? (laughs) Yeah. 
but this was 1905 oh, in Mexico. Never mind. Never so, mind. <laughs> yeah. kind of a different situation. Okay. I don't Just th- a little, like, slightly different. I think 1905 America, we didn't pay for children either. No, no. Definitely not. They were like, just send them off to an orphanage. Yeah. Yeah. Or make them get a job at 14. Right. <laughs> Put them in a factory. Definitely child labor or orphanage yeah. or, yeah, boarding school. Just, that was it. You know, you learn to be useful as right? a kid. <laughs> Self-sufficient, resourceful, independent. Yeah. Make yourself valuable to the team. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but also be seen and not heard. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's tough to be a kid. Yeah. <laughs> so the... Uh, the Gonzalez Venezuelas would go on to have four daughters over 15 years. So there was Delfina, Maria de Jesus, Carmen, and Maria Luisa. Two Marias? Yeah. Okay. Just, you know, okay. Maria it up. In case the first one doesn't work out. I mean, you may need a re- replacement Maria. You yeah. never know. What an unsettling life. <laughs> With each child, of course, like I said, they kind of sunk deeper into poverty. With each child, there was just more and more hardship piled on, uh, less ability to take care of the children, less ability to pay the bills, all that, just more financial trouble. I mean, that's basically how I see children just in general, is just like this gnarly burden that you take (laughs) on for the next 20 years. But, you know, especially the less money you have, the less resources, you know, the less opportunity. Yeah. That really, it's just so tough. And if you're balling, you could get Menendez. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Law and Order Menendez Brothers Woo! represent. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so with the growing family, like I said, it just became harder for them. And oftentimes the entire family went hungry. Their father, Isidro, ruled the house with basically an iron fist. It was a lot of discipline. He had a very heavy hand. He was always criticizing and punishing the family members. By all accounts, he was cold and abusive. Everybody remembers him as a hard ass, basically. Not only to everybody else, but his family most of all. He basically was focusing more on kind of making his daughter's obedience than being a loving father. He was really only concerned with them behaving well, you know, instead of being loving. Isidro's daughters were often the biggest focus of his rage and vengeance. By all accounts, of course, he was abusive to his wife, but it seemed to be his daughters were the biggest trigger for him. Like he saw them as an extension of his himself. Mm -hmm. So he wanted them to be the best and he was constantly punishing them as a way to kind of get them to do what he thought was right, Mm -hmm. you know. He was really controlling of all their behavior. They were punished for pretty much anything that he saw as an infraction or the wrong decision or whatever. Anything that he disapproved of, you get punished. You get grounded for this, you know, abused for that, like whatever it was. I'm going to need like a list of house rules posted right? somewhere. Like, what the <laughs> Seriously. But if any of the girls were caught wearing makeup, if they had certain clothing he didn't, approve of they would get punished and not only was it physical punishment he also was a police officer so he had access to the town's jail and he would punish them by putting them in jail as like young teenagers or tweens basically why else would you be a cop (laughs) i mean (laughs) jesus christ perks (laughs) company card and access to the jail (laughs) Oh my God, how horrible. Yeah, yeah. He would apparently put them in jail for like an entire weekend if they wore a skirt that was too high or something like that. It was kind of fucking ridiculous. Go fuck yourself. Right? Asshole. So he was a member of the police force, but it wasn't really a normal police force. He was actually a member of an independent group of local men who fought crime in their small town because the town wasn't really big enough for an actual organized police force. So the townspeople came together and kind of separated these shifts and appointed different people to become a kind of rural police force. Like a militia task force police Kinda, force. Kind of. Okay. Yeah. But yeah. just a self-appointed exactly. police force. Right. Yeah. It. I don't know. It wasn't really legit enough to be a real police force, but it was one step above, let's say, Neighborhood Watch or something, you know? It was similar to kind of Neighborhood Watch, but a little bit more proactive. They kind of got all up in the crime 
and tried to really actively stop it. And if they needed to get violent, they would, that kind of stuff, instead of just reporting things. There were no girls in skirts in that town. Hell no, they were all in jail. (laughs) These officers would ride through town on horseback and look for suspicious activity. That was their main function. If violence or crime happened, they would jump in to stop it. And by all accounts, the girl's father, Isidro, was a crooked cop. So apparently, I mean, there were a bunch of people on this police force that really didn't become members of it to abuse their power. But Isidro was not one of those people. He wanted access to the jail. He wanted the power. He wanted to kind of intimidate people, take advantage of them, that kind of stuff. Yeah, people have to take you seriously. Like your crazy judgment or your just your crazy rules. Seriously, if you're if you give someone like that power. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So he would get violent with people that didn't listen to him. He would tax people for his services, kind of like the mob's protection kind of services. And he would steal from people in the neighborhood as well, you know, and there was nothing they could do because he was part of the police. Who are you going to report it to? Yeah. Who do you pay to protect them from him? Right. (laughs) So he was disliked by most people in town. Like everybody knew that he was crooked. In one incident, it escalated because not only was he just shitty to everybody, but he actually shot a man during an argument. So someone disagreed with him that was committing some sort of petty crime or maybe just drunk and disorderly or whatever. He confronted them. It escalated. They argued. And he just pulled out a gun and just flat out shot someone. And by all accounts, he wasn't really in danger. It wasn't self-defense by any stretch, you know? Wow. Yeah. And he was never punished for the murder. It was a flat-out murder. He never was held accountable. Because he was part of the rural police, again, he just kind of, abuse of power, got away with it. Mutiny, please? Right? (laughs) (laughs) So the community and his family were both afraid of him. After the murder, there was enough people in the town that wanted to hold him accountable that the family decided to move. It became a little bit of an unstable situation. The family was afraid and they decided to just pick up, get out of town, move somewhere where it was safer, you know? Mm -hmm. So since he acquired a lot of enemies, the whole family relocated. And as the Gonzalez Venezuela sisters grew older, they suffered overwhelming financial insecurity. And they were extremely afraid that they would never be able to escape poverty. So in their new location, they tried anything they could in their new town to make money by any means necessary. They really just wanted to make sure they didn't go hungry and didn't stay poor. You know what sells? Um, pussy. There you go. I'm going to say back massages, but you got it. We all know what back massages are. (laughs) Funny thing about my back is it's located on my dick. (laughs) So the sisters put together some money and opened up businesses in their new town. At first they opened up a saloon and then they saved money from that business And they opened up new locations. They tried to find, especially like bars and stuff like that, nightclubs, that was their thing. Yeah. So the alcohol business, of course, is pretty lucrative. You know, there's, it's an area where there's a lot of people in poverty and they want to like go into these bars and kind of let loose. And it was really lucrative for them. It, you know, it kept them fed. It kept them out of poverty. It, of course, had to be split amongst the family but they were still making a living even though it wasn't just one sole business owner they were still able to open more businesses and kind of buy the things they needed and stuff like that they were providing yeah they really didn't have to struggle as much for the first time in their life you know but they still of course because of that poverty fear they wanted more yeah it wasn't enough for them it's almost like ptsd from being poor like you don't want to you never want to be like that again. Absolutely. But the thing is, they haven't heard the song Mo Money, Mo Problems. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the issue here. It was too early. It hadn't been written yet. So that led to murder. <laughs> <laughs> if only it came out in 1905. <laughs> So they continued to find new ways to make money and they were always trying to figure out what would be more lucrative for them. New business ventures, new partnerships, whatever they could do to increase their profit. So they were scheming new ways to make money. No matter who they had to fuck over, just like their dad, they just wanted to take care of themselves, look out for number one. Mm -hmm. 
the sisters decided that they could triple their income if they opened up brothels. Mm. Right? Pussy, it's always the answer. It seriously is. Pussy for president. <laughs> you hungry? Pussy. <laughs> you tired? Pussy. <laughs> you got a cold? Alka-Seltzer and pussy. <laughs> So at first, they hired local women to work for them and operated the brothels like out of basically the back of their bar. So it was kind of a side business. They didn't really open up new locations. There was nothing that was traceable by the cops, stuff like that. You know, they just kind of had it hidden. They're just selling $75 shots, $50 shots. (laughs) Just like, damn. Wink, wink, wink. I'll take the $100, (laughs) the best you got. Preferably 18. I'll take the brown wing <laughs> yeah. for 200. <laughs> but 18 year fresh, fresh, ripe. Ew. Yeah. They had a wide range of clientele. They had a lot of people that were just local ranchers, stuff like that. But there was also people that were law enforcement and even politicians that were visiting their brothels. So they started making a lot of money pretty quickly. Mm-hmm. Some people in the community had major issues with the brothels. There was often violence and crime around their bar slash brothels, and the neighborhood really didn't appreciate it. You relate, right? Because there's that hotel on the corner. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> the amount of sex workers in this area, it's like, per, per square foot is kind of crazy. It's insane. <laughs> Like, if there was a Megan's Law, you know, for, like, sex workers mm. on my corner, my shit would be lit up. Oh, dude. yeah. <laughs> the epicenter next to my apartment. It's kind of crazy. But it's good if I ever want a part-time, you I know? feel like that's the thing that, that it's known for. Like, whenever I say, like, oh, I'm right next to Van Nuys. Like, my neighborhood is the next one over. Yeah. And they're like, oh, that's just a lot of, a lot of sex workers there. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, you're near Sepulveda? Wow. Oh. <laughs> That's that's what we're known for. Yeah, don't that's ever what get a bring positive. to the table. Yeah, no one's ever like, "Ooh, Van Nuys." They're just beautiful, like beautiful, sunny Van Nuys. <laughs> <laughs> Full of pussy. <laughs> All day. The pussy capital, honestly. Yeah, oh, it's crazy. So the brothels often got in trouble with local law enforcement, but the sisters bribed them to not interfere, mm-hmm. basically. So they paid off anyone they need to to stay out of trouble. Even though, you know, the bars and brothels were really causing an increase in crime, much like Van Nuys, (laughs) it really, you know, was a situation where they did whatever they needed to to keep it low, low profile. Yeah. You know, they paid them off. They also offered them sexual favors. So any of the police that came around, they would offer them a girl or even sometimes the sisters would just like in the middle of a conversation, if I understand it correctly, would just like... Start going for the dick. Yes. <laughs> they know how to get things uh, done. Oh, you want to arrest us? Oh, you want to shut down our bill? That's oh, nice. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> how do you feel now? <laughs> Are you changing your mind yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me spit on it. <laughs> so... They would offer them themselves or the girls and this worked or money. It yeah. kind of like they would read the situation and the particular police officer and whatever seemed like more of a priority to them. They yeah. would just give it over. Which what's your cup of tea, basically? Yeah. What, what what's can, your cup of pussy? Yeah. <laughs> what can we buy you with? <laughs> so the Gonzalez sisters basically had no problem using sex, violence, money, any sort of anything to make sure that they were always financially secure. <laughs> Kind of like the Lannisters. <laughs> <laughs> so much like the Lannisters. So much. Uh. <laughs> As the brothels became profitable, they started to invest the money back again and just, you know, kept folding over and they would keep buying new locations and expanding their businesses. They kept expanding even further out into different locations. So they didn't really stay in the town. Once it really became more successful, they spread out to different areas. They opened up brothels in San Francisco del Rincón, Parísima del Rincón, León, Guadalajara, and El Salto, San Juan, uh, a bunch of different places. So they were all over in a ton of different towns. Yeah. Yeah. So Carmen, Delfina, and Maria de Jesús, who was called Chewy, operated the locations in Guanajuato and Jalisco. Maria Luisa, known as 
Eva, the leggy one, (laughs) ran the brothel near the Mexican borders. So the sisters bought a bar in Lagos, Jalisco, from a gay man named El Pokianki, (laughs) which I tried to look up. It's it's a fun word. Yeah. And I was like, I got to know what this means. And there's no translation. I couldn't find anything. It seems to be just maybe... I don't know, like a, a variation on his name or some yeah. sort of childhood nickname or something. Kyanki is like a, an Armenian word for like girl, like. A, really? Yeah. Kyanki. Is, oh, I think. But, I mean, it's not that's interesting. Armenian, but yeah. Yeah. So he was called he was called El Pokyanki. But when the, the business transferred over to the sisters, the name Pokyanki stuck and the like sisters it. became referred to as. Las Pokiancas or something like uh-huh. that. Yeah. So for some reason, they just figured the name came with the bar or something. <laughs> yeah, we're buying that too. <laughs> Los, Lo, oh no, Las Pokiancas. Can I be, um, Kel's the Peggy one? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> and I'll be Bree the Dick Fingers. <laughs> 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 oh shit <laughs> but some people call me eagle <laughs> i'm all about cool nicknames holy shit <laughs> <laughs> so they inherited this nickname with the bar and some people even locally would just refer to them at other businesses as lost pokey Yankees. lost pokey Yankees, i love it <laughs> They hated the nickname, oh. but it stuck. Pokiankies. <laughs> so their main location was called Rancho El Angel near the town of San Francisco del Rincón, which is like 200 miles north of Mexico City. Cool. As their businesses expanded, they looked for more girls to work in the new locations. And this is where it takes a turn. They hit up all the malls and stuff. <laughs> right? <laughs> It was like how Tiffany got signed in the 80s. (laughs) So since they were always prioritizing money over morals and, you know, stuff like that, they decided to increase their profits by preying on all the local young girls. They stopped hiring people altogether and basically resorted to low-key, like, kidnapping and sex slavery. You could have had a great business if you just got girls that were willing I mean, right? everybody's coming from these small towns out of just extreme desperation and poverty, you know? So yeah. they really could have given them low wages. It was yeah. almost, it seems to me, not that that's okay at all, but it almost seems to me like they wanted to hurt people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, no, it's totally. like, of course, you know, you're taking advantage of them by not paying them enough. But even at that point, you're still making the decision to pay for them. But... Once you kidnap them, you really are making the decision to hurt someone. Yeah. You know, and and to be, um, you know, even though the community doesn't like them, if you make yourself an asset to the like where if most of the girls in your town are Are finding work where they didn't have jobs before or something, you're probably less likely to get shut down. Right. If people are supporting you and their lives depend on it, you know, you're their income or, you know, that you're. You help their family live. I, yes. I think you probably could have gotten away with it. If yeah. Just been a little bit more legit. Absolutely. Absolutely. Totally agree. So they would go out into rural countryside areas and seek out the prettiest girls in really small remote villages. They would approach the girls and offer them positions as either waitresses or barmaids, bartenders, or even just maids to clean the house. Sometimes they would say that they're hiring for their own business. Sometimes they would say they're hiring for a maid to work at their house or that they just knew there was an open position at, you know, a local bar. Just come with me and I'll get you hired, you know. Like Chuck Berry. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, no, come on, baby. Work in my club. Right? (laughs) Sure, Chuck Berry. I mean, it really is. It's just someone's going to take you at your word, you know. So they would do the same thing that they would do with the police earlier, where they would gauge the girl and see kind of what would win her over and basically tell them anything they needed to, to get them to come with them that day. They would just show up at a home or stop a girl on the the street and just say, you know, here's the opportunity I have. Come with me now. 
you know, and they would just have to pack a bag and come with them. Sometimes they would say they needed help around their own house, make them feel more comfortable, depending on how they read the girl. You know, if she was reluctant, they'd say, you're just going to be working for me. Look at me. I'm nice, whatever, blah, blah, blah. If the girl seemed a little bit more kind of okay with the situation or looking for opportunities, then that's when they would say it's a job at a bar or at a restaurant, you know. Other times, they would put out classified ads and lie to them about the type of job that they were going to be fulfilling. The sisters would also kind of canvas the street and seek out runaways that really didn't have their family. So some of these girls they took from their family and took out of the home, but other girls, they saw them on the street, they knew that they were alone and desperate. And so they said, we'll help you. And basically made it seem like they were doing something charitable and helping them out, you know. So they would offer, especially the runaway girls, they would give them food while they were having these conversations. They would give them, you know, offer them shelter and safety and say, okay, maybe come to my hotel room or anything like that that they needed to to make them feel more safe, more it, taken care of. Is that kind of like grooming or is oh, it? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Totally. And it's a very quick form of grooming because mm-hmm. it's very like you're really providing them this feeling that they're safe with you yeah. in a very quick way, you know. But yeah, someone that's starving and someone that, you know, is you know living in a home that is maybe falling apart or is on in a situation that's unsafe. If you're offering them that, then yeah. that's the solution to all their problems. Everybody wants a way out. Yeah. I want to leave pretty much every day. If someone <laughs> offered me a waitressing position and right. told me it's out of town right now, I'd be like, fuck yeah, let's go. Let's I want to leave it. L.A. pretty much every day. Yeah. So if someone's got a couch. Seriously. <laughs> I don't even need a couch. We can we'll bring... podcast from your couch and just snuggle. Yeah. We'll true crime and chill on your couch exactly. and podcast. Until you get tired of us. <laughs> <laughs> We're really good roommates. Um, I get up in the middle of the night and eat everything. Well, you know, we'll just lock their fridge. I'll get through. <laughs> it like, just looks like Wolverine attacked it. <laughs> all I do is win, man. I'll find some snacks. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> So no matter what the tactic was to get these girls, they would always promise them room and board as part of the position. Mm -hmm. So that was something that offered them like safety and security that no matter what, even if they're not making a good wage or even if whatever happens, they'll still eat. They will still have a roof over their head, you know, and that for a lot of these girls was a better situation than they were coming from. So this helped them entice the girls into relocating and especially with the sense of urgency that they needed to go that day without really thinking it over or anything, you know. They didn't have to worry about these things that had been plaguing them before, you know. Mm -hmm. Often, the women agreed to go with the Gonzalez sisters because they were elated to escape this small town that they were in along with the poverty, you know? Yeah. So it wasn't really always about the money. It was just about opportunity and going to a bigger city and stuff like that. They promised that they would make a comfortable living and they told them that they would be making a lot of money. Boo. Yeah. And they made it seem to these girls like if they relocated with them, they would be living lavishly. Like this was an opportunity to be almost like, you know, what they would envision, you know, a celebrity would live like or whatever, you know. So the girls had only known a lot of times these small towns and and, you know, um, really struggled to survive. So they had these dreams of a big city and the Gonzalez sisters really made that a real possibility for them. They often felt that they were fortunate to have the sisters find them. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. They started to feel like, oh, I'm a lucky one. You know? And I think, you know, it also put them at ease that the Gonzalez sisters were female. Mm -hmm. If a man would have approached them with these same tactics, maybe they would have been a little bit less comfortable. But the fact that they were women, they felt like this kind of sisterhood bond or a maternal kind of thing. So they felt a little bit more safe. They let their guard down. They were more trusting. Yeah, you're less skeptical if it's a woman. Yes, it's like a woman, she's going to take care of me. She's going to look out for me in a way that maybe a man wouldn't, Mm -hmm. you know? So they trusted them because they thought that it was less likely that these other women would take advantage of them. 
you know? Mm -hmm. They, of course, were aware of this and would often take on this big sister or motherly role and play that up, like totally try and manipulate by being maternal. God, their business sense and their just sense to like sociopaths or something or psychopaths or I don't I never know the difference, but like you know what I mean? It's just so fucking scary. Yeah. Yeah. So I also think in addition to all that that it also plays on someone's ego to think that they're chosen, you know, that you Mm -hmm. saw me on the street and I'm the one that is going to make it because I'm beautiful or, you know what I mean? It's kind of this ego boost or whatever. Yeah. And it's always a rags to riches story. Everybody wants to be that. Yeah. It's like Um, winning the lottery is kind of how they felt. And if you are a really pretty girl too, I'm sure you do notice like the attention and mm -hmm. stuff, you know? So you, you probably have that in your head too. Like, yeah. Everybody wants to be special. Yes, and that's what the Gonzalez sisters offered. They offered security and safety and opportunity and the feeling that they were special. They were literally the key to women. Just make them feel special (laughs) and fucking make them think that you're listening to them. Also find the clit. (laughs) (laughs) But, I mean, if you can't find the clit, just listening helps. Yeah, that helps. helps. I mean, that'll get you halfway there. Almost as good as the clit. Almost, yeah. (laughs) So sometimes when the Gonzalez sisters felt like taking a heavy handed approach, they would bring along Delfina's boyfriend named Herman Gildo Zuniga. Hate anyone named Herman. <laughs> <laughs> True story. He's got to be bad, right? I oh, can yeah. hate on Herman. Yeah, there's never a good character named Herman. Yep. You know, that's always like the evil cartoon character. Yeah, <laughs> totally. So Herman Gildo was an army captain nicknamed the Black Eagle. Oh. <laughs> so he was somewhat of a tough guy and a petty criminal. If the sisters decided that they wanted a certain girl that they had picked out, she was beautiful, that was the girl they wanted, Herman Gildo would just snatch her off the street. If the conversation didn't work, basically, on the first day, he would come back and just take the girl. Like a caveman just hitting a woman yes. over the head. And then... That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah, he just kind of threw them over his shoulder and walked away. That's crazy. Yeah. So as time went on, the Gonzalez sisters basically stopped putting the energy into rec- recruiting girls through deceiving them and promising them all these things because that, of course, takes way too much energy. Yeah. And they basically turn to kidnapping. Work smarter, not harder. (laughs) Oh, that's what it is. Perfect. (laughs) So they were no longer kind of pretending to hire people. They would just flat out steal them. Jesus. Yeah. Usually it was Herman Gildo that was doing this or their friend Estrada, the executioner, Bocanegra. He, He also helped with a lot of the kidnapping and the dirty work. But they also kind of put this out there that anybody that brought them girls would be paid. Oh, no. Yes. So especially like, of course, not just a random person on the street, but anybody they had contact with kind of in the criminal underworld, they would say, OK, I'll give you however many dollars for every girl. Are so we, people would show up like with 10 yeah. or 20 girls. Are we talking about a fucking porn company? Because I seriously feel like this is a porn company right, right now. <laughs> no, this hasn't happened at Hustler like two years ago. Yeah, <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, no, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, basically, they were trying to do the minimum thing by not hiring these women, but stealing them. But on top of that, when they the coercion didn't work, they just kidnapped, yeah. you know? And yeah, it was completely just human trafficking. It was crazy. And then just paid recruiters. Yeah. Like, uh, the finder's fee. Like, it's what so the nuts. Fuck? And I don't mean to sound kind of like tone deaf or cold or anything, but this is one of those things or those moments that makes me grateful for, you know, social media and having a cell phone and that kind of mm-hmm. stuff because it m- does make it that much harder in a lot of places where you do have access to that technology for someone to take you. Yeah. It still happens. I'm not saying it's impossible, but something like this, like word would get out, you yeah. know, look out for the fucking black eagle, God damn it. Totally. You know, I mean, I don't know. I just, it makes me sad that that wasn't happening in this era so that yeah. people just disappeared and nobody could find them. Yelp reviews of the bar. Right. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. But I don't know. I just, I don't know. It just makes me sad that they, they didn't have that. Cause I mean, I don't know, these girls would just flat out disappear into thin air. 
in the late 1950s, Carmen, one of the sisters, died of cancer. The sisters, you know, lost one of their partners. And of course, this was kind of looked at as increased profit for them. Oh, of course. <laughs> yeah. Fucking bitches. Wow. Why would they? Um... Yeah. They just kind of pressed on. They absorbed the extra profit and the, the other businesses that she was managing. Damn. And that was it. Yeah. Like nothing happened. So no matter what method they used to get the girls there, once the girls arrived at the brothels, they quickly discovered that they had been deceived. Immediately after arriving, the girls would be raped, intimidated, and showered with ice water to kind of break their spirits pretty much immediately upon arrival. That'll do it. Yeah. Especially because you just thought you were about to go live out your dream. Right. Yeah. Heartbreaking. At their Guadalajara de Noche and Barca de Oro bars, the young girls would be put to work sometimes if they were way too underage and they were kind of waiting them for them to get older. Ugh. So that was kind of the best case scenario was that you could at least have a reprieve for a small time. The girls were held captive and forced to be sex slaves. What? Sorry about that, but what a fucking waiting game. It's kind of, again, back to Game of Thrones, but remember when, like, Sansa Stark was, like, praying her fucking period wouldn't get there, so she didn't yes. have to do that? Like, yes. you're just hoping you don't get your fucking rag. Yeah. And if so, but you on hide top the of shit that, out of it. it. I mean, the way that the women were, the Gonzalez sisters were motivated by money, it seems like they were saving these girls for the highest bidder. Oh, my God. So on top of that, it was kind of like they were waiting it out, but they were also basically saving them for someone that will pay more money. The virgins, yeah. Yeah. Oh, barf. Where's totally the <laughs> fucking awful. So the, Con- the Gonzalez sisters would quickly get the new recruits hooked on drugs and turn them into basically sex zombies. If the women refused the drugs, the sisters would hold them down and force them to do cocaine and heroin. The new girls would become addicted very quickly and the sisters used the drugs and withdrawal and this kind of back and forth thing to control them and convince them to do different things for them and make them more compliant. Some of the girls were still virgins, so the sisters just made them do cooking, cleaning, and waiting on clients until a high-paying customer came along and would buy their virginity. And even after that, because they were so young, even once they lost their virginity, they would say they were still virgins yeah. or just because they were so young charge more money you know what's stupid is that um they were trying to cut costs by doing all this terrible shit when in reality you're buying fucking heroin coke right all this other risk that like d- there's no way you're saving money it's that's like, one I don't... of the things i was thinking i was like you're saving money here but you're spending it all there just not cheap. just get women that you pay yeah and that's it yeah exactly you don't even have I don't but know. again like i said earlier i think this is a conscious choice yeah. to hurt people yeah totally that's the thing is like upon first reading this story i was like okay these women are just like really trying to make money yeah i get that but on top of that i think there's this element where it's not money that's the motivator no. it's really about taking advantage of people and hurting them and causing them pain cruelty is a it big thing it is yeah it's totally just a, a reason to be cruel and punish people mm-hmm. and that's just a result of growing up constantly being punished and abused you yeah. know they're just repeating that cycle it's joint politics right <laughs> become an overachiever go the opposite direction yeah, like the other half of people exactly. that are abused so the girls of course they were sex slaves they received zero payment for their work they were forced every step of the way there was never a point where they were an employee in an employer employee relationship it was always sex slavery the customers would come in and the sisters would let them choose a girl If the girl refused to have sex with the client, she would either get raped, drugged and raped, or severely beaten. If she kept refusing, the torture and beatings would continue until she died. Oh my god. Yeah. When the sisters punished one of the girls, they always did it in front of everybody else as an intimidation tactic and to make them sure that they would be disobedient. Yeah. And the girls were imprisoned against their will and were never allowed to go outside. They were in basically, not cells, but held in shacks that were locked, you know. 
Many of them didn't see daylight once the sisters took them into captivity. So for however long they were with the sisters, it may even be years, they would never see sun. Holy shit. Yeah. Once they were in captivity, the prisoners were guarded by the Black Eagle and Delfina's son, Ramon Torres, a.k.a. El Tepo. El Tepo. That sounds like a really weak name. Yeah. I'm not a fan of that. El Tepo. Tepo. It's kind of wishy-washy. Kind of annoying. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Doesn't sound strong, like a real, like, like you know, sociopath that kills women. Fucking Black Eagle, man. Right? Because you know the Black Eagle means business. Yeah. Yeah. So if the prisoners attempted to escape, they would be punished severely, then drugged to ensure they were less resistant. One of the punishments that they used was to make the girls beat each other. They would threaten that if they didn't fight, then they would get a more severe beating from one of the guards. They would often make a group of girls beat up one girl if that one girl got in trouble. It's just unfair. It, yeah, Jesus. I just, I can't even imagine. No. I always like call back to other episodes we did, but it was like that Australia one that we did, the Queensland one where the kid joined in and oh, hurting yeah. his friend. You know what I mean? It's like you have this choice you of self-preservation yeah. and you don't want to lose your life. No. So you join in on something that is so severely awful, but you're too afraid to not do it. Exactly. You have no other choice, really. Yeah. Well, unless you want to die, but I mean... <laughs> So here's a barf cauldron thing. If one of the girls became pregnant, she was hung up by her hands from the ceiling and then beaten until she lost the baby. Oh, my God. They could just tickle her and the same thing would happen. Oh, no. No, No, that's so unbelievably awful. Yeah, that's the part where it's just my heart. Like, why? Like, I can't. uh, Yeah, so, no, definitely it's... This is just... um, Supporting that of them just being cruel. Yes. This has nothing to do with money. Exactly. This is more evidence of them just wanting to hurt women instead of just about business, you know? Uh. Yeah. After the brothels have been open for a bit, the sisters had come up with solutions for some of the sex industry pitfalls. Since contraception was not prioritized, the girls began getting pregnant and contracting STDs. Oh, shit. Yeah. So the sisters would force the girls to, you know, abort their babies or hurt them until they had a miscarriage. And then they would burn the bodies at the ranch or bury them behind the brothels. If a girl got too sick from an STD or any other kind of health issue she was suffering from or malnourishment, there was a bunch of things that, of course, were plaguing these prisoners or even like a botched abortion or miscarriage or anything like that. Yeah. And they're all doped up, too. How many things happen from that? Overdoses. Oh, yeah. So if there was someone that was weaker, sicker, you know, under the weather, whatever, they would kill the girl. Instead of trying to get them medical attention. If the girl became unable to work for any of those reasons, they would kill them. When the sisters decided that they wanted to get rid of a girl, they would use a few different methods. They had separate kill rooms that were kind of inside these jail cell whatever. Mm -hmm. And each location, each brothel had a separate room where they would take a girl that was going to be killed it's not the champagne room i know (laughs) i know i'm sorry dude it's okay no it's it's, it's halloween (laughs) (laughs) so oftentimes of course they would give them really severe beatings Mm -hmm. other times they would simply like lock a girl in the kill room and make her starve to death And sometimes they would do two girls at once so one of them would starve and in the process of her basically dying alone they would imprison another girl in that same room and you would see this other person die in front of you and know that you're going to die the same way what unless you eat that other person (laughs) i'm swear to god that's where my brain's going wouldn't you debate that i was wondering if they were chained or anything i'm not sure i really don't know so it's a mental breakdown yeah because that's really just gonna shake you to your foundation so fucked up and you're hungry too like not only right i don't know 
sometimes, of course, like I said, they would make the girls beat each other up. Mm -hmm. But when they decided to get rid of one girl, they would also use the same tactic, but they would arm the girls. So if they wanted to kill one of the, the women, they would give them sticks or pipes or anything like that and make them beat the other girl to death. Yeah. And once someone had passed away and the body was disposed of by the Black Eagle. In addition to killing a lot of these girls, the Gonzalez sisters sometimes targeted their customers and other men as well. It wasn't in defense of their girls, which is something that like immediately I just thought, okay, well, if there was a customer trying to rape a girl, maybe you would stand up for them. Of course, my wishful thinking brain. But that wasn't the case. They would target men that had a lot of money. So they would come in as a customer. They would basically open up their wallet. They would see the amount of cash that they had on them. And they would kill a person that had too much cash. Because of all the violence that was known to happen here, over time, the main location, Rancho El Angel, was nicknamed the Bordello from Hell. One day in 1963, Jalisco cops came to one of the Gonzalez brothels. Delfina's son, Ramon Torres, got into an argument with the police that quickly escalated to violence. During the altercation, police shot Ramon and killed him. Shit. Yes. This is a very special day for Murder Dictionary because this is the first time I've ever been pro-police violence. <laughs> <laughs> Because, uh, yeah, just the amount of women that he killed and tortured. and Yeah, fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. Yeah. So after he died, the police closed down that brothel. Ramon's mother, Delfina, was devastated and furious. And, of course, she was awful enough before the death. But once she lost her son, she definitely became unhinged. She ordered uh, the Black Eagle to track down the cops who killed her son and kill them on the spot. Oh, shit. Yeah. I've said, oh, shit, like five times in a row, but I really Sorry. have nothing else to say, but like, oh, shit. I know this story. It's like there's not even much you can add to it. It's just like, oh, my God, it's, just it's so heavy and worse. awful. Like, yeah. but, it's, but also, too, like if they closed down one brothel, what makes you think all their other business establishments are? Right. They've aren't... got how many? There's 10 more. Yeah. I mean, you got to go track down these other places. No, it was only this one that was a brothel. Right. <laughs> so the as legend has it, he found all the cops and he killed them off one by one. And it's also, it's really hard. This story, part of the element that makes it so heavy and sad is the fact that none of these people really have names. There's no identity to these victims. And that's of course, you know, how far like long ago it was in the past, but also maybe the small like rural towns that they were operating in where the girls were taken from. But that adds this really extra yeah. depression kind of heaviness to me. And just the, mm -hmm. learning about this story, it was like, none of these people have names. No. They're just dying left and right. And we don't know who they are. In the time era, too. Like, it's yeah. not a really good time for, you know, it's all like not not Internet where you can track everything. And stuff, right. So. Yeah. They Bummer. can just disappear. You think that they get lost a little bit and they're mm. not as remembered as much. Yep. Well, that's sad. I know. But we're talking about them, so. <laughs> yes. So the police were aware that the Gonzalez sisters were running an illegal business, but they didn't know the danger that the girls were in. When people showed up, I don't know how they kind of presented this picture of willing sexual partners, but somehow people didn't really realize that they were all sex slaves. I have no idea how that's possible. Yeah, and because the cops were some of the patrons. Right, and that's the other the thing is out. because they were blackmailed or bribed or, you know, given sexual favors or yeah. anything like that, they were less likely to pursue anything. So the police were puzzled by the disappearance of so many girls, though. And for a long time, they didn't really link the girls working at the brothels to the disappearance. There are two conflicting accounts of how the sisters were caught. And possibly it was a combination of the two things that kind of brought attention to the Gonzalez sisters and their businesses. It started to unravel in 1964. One day police officers were out on patrol and they came across a woman named Josefina Gutierrez. The officers stopped her 
and shook her down because she was very well known as a petty criminal. Um, she was involved in the underworld and they knew she was up to something basically. Yeah. So they're like, let's ask her some questions. They knew that her main thing was drugs and sex work. So the alarming thing was that she had a bunch of young girls with her. It sounds like it was a dozen or 20, something like That's that. That's not fucking obvious. Right? It's a yes. field trip. Right? What the- <laughs> Permission slips. How else do you explain that? Yeah fucking nuts gonna go get our nails done (laughs) what so the police decided to bring her in for questioning once she was being interrogated and threatened with kidnapping charges she informed the detectives that she was taking the girls to the bordello from hell aka rancho el angel from this they rounded up a few other associated criminals that were known in the area and tried to gather more information and build a get bigger case you know their real intention was to get a warrant so if they had enough information from other criminals they could storm in there and yeah. you know get these people out how about why are you taking the girls to the ranch? Right. <laughs> so let's just start there. Yeah, I don't know how just her account wasn't enough, but they just kept trying to find more information. State your business. Right. Please. <laughs> <laughs> the other incident that happened was in January 1964. One of the prisoners called Catalina Ortega managed to find a small hole in the wall of the room that she was imprisoned in. So she, it seems like, found this little hole at the very bottom of the wall because it was a shack that wasn't very well built. And she kept digging out until she was able to crawl out underneath. She expanded the opening and kept digging until she could fit her whole body through. And then she fled the compounds. Remember, I'm going to be happy. Remember when you showed me a goat doing the same thing? Oh, I did. <laughs> I'm just trying to be happy. Man. Yeah, let's try and, and lighten goat. it up. I yeah. have a video of a baby goat getting under a fence and also buying, biting a chicken. Or no, no, the baby goat in that same video mm-hmm. gets bit in the butthole by a chicken. <laughs> See, it was probably a prisoner. Right? <laughs> Freedom and buttholes. <laughs> So she fled the compound. Yeah, good for her. Go and Catalina. although Catalina knew that she would be killed if she was caught, right. she just kept running. She believed it was worth the risk, yeah. you know, if she just ran as fast as she could, as far as she could, that she would be able to escape. The Gonzalez sisters discovered that she had uh, escaped the room oh, no. and went missing, and they sent the Black Eagle to find her and kill her. But they were unable to find her. Yes. Yes. She like hid in the rural area, just tried to make it through the town. Like, yeah. Thank goodness. And she successfully made her escape and uh, got people to help her and eventually made it back to her mom. Fuck, how do you trust anyone on that road? Right? How are you like, hey, who do I yes, ask for help? who do I talk to? Oh, you can't talk to the cops because yeah. what if, I mean. Exactly. Shit. How many people do they have on their payroll? So if you run into one of them. Oh, man. You're fucked. Yeah. So her mom, when she arrived home, took her to the police. But they both knew that there was that possibility that the police officers would be, you know, under the Gonzalez sister's thumb, basically. There was also the possibility that, you know, they were on the payroll or were customers and that they maybe even would be minimized, like because it's a violence against women, that there was also a possibility that they just wouldn't believe them flat out because they didn't take those kind of things seriously. Yeah. You know, luckily, the officers that were on duty were very responsive to Catalina's information and took her story very seriously. They had no affiliation with the Gonzalez sisters and they took the report and got the warrant, basically. The police observed that Catalina was extremely nervous and had difficulty telling her story and uh, recounting what she'd went through at the ranch. The detectives also observed her physical state and could tell she was malnourished and physically abused. They quickly got a search warrant and arrest warrants for Chewy and Delfina that were working at that particular location. On January 14th, 1964, they raided Rancho El Angel. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. Aw. Yeah. 
Unfortunately, <laughs> the Gonzalez sisters had fled, but they had left behind many of the girls, so they were able to at least free the girls. And they left behind some of the men that they used for muscles. They were able to make a few arrests as well. The girls were freed, given medical attention, food, whatever they needed, and then the police went on a manhunt for the sisters. Mm -hmm. As the police and reporters were exploring the ranch, some of the girls pointed to spots in the ground and told them that that's where they could find bodies. Like right under your leg. Yes. <laughs> oh so my God. I think that the police initially were just going there because of the sex slavery. And then additionally, that's when they found out that there were murders going on. Police eventually tracked down Delfina and Maria de Jesus and apprehended them. But they were only able to find two of the sisters. There was still another one at large. They brought them back to the property and had them watch as the bordello was raided and their muscle, including the Black Eagle, were forced to dig up the property where the girls had pointed out the bodies. While volunteers also excavated the bodies, the sisters stood on the side wearing all black as if they were in mourning. Oh, These fuck, fucking dude. bitches. Oh, man. Yeah. A search of the property led to the bodies of 11 men... 80 women. Oh, my God. And uh, an un uncounted number of fetuses. They started wearing black that day and continued all the way through the trial with this whole thing, this bullshit of wearing black like they're in mourning. No, 80 women. Shut right? up. 80 women. Yes. 11 dudes. An absurd amount of fetus, feti, feti fetuses. That's crazy. Up. How dare you? I know. I know. Wow. Word of the raid spread fast and a crowd gathered at the Bordello from Hell during the raid. And there were bystanders that like watched the whole thing as the bodies were coming out. The sisters were led off the property and into custody and many of the angry locals were there watching this. They were yelling at them, demanding justice, throwing things, whatever they could. The police were keeping them safe, but the community was clearly already out for blood. Yeah, You know, good. they had snatched their daughters and sisters off the street, you know. The sisters were taken to jail under heavy military guard. And the judge ruled that the sisters should be relocated to another jail since the whole town pretty much wanted to murder them. Yeah. So they knew they weren't safe. A week later, Maria Luisa contacted local police and demanded immunity if she turned herself in. No, bitch. Try mm, again, though. Hell no. We can talk it out. <laughs> A judge agreed not to punish her harshly, so she went to the Mexico City police station and she did turn herself in. I like that judge or that guy. <laughs> right? oh, yeah, harshly. Define no harshly. No problem. Got you, girl. It's subjective. <laughs> <laughs> she was afraid of the townspeople killing her, basically, and she believed that she would be safer in jail than out on the streets. <laughs> 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 However awesome judge went back on his promise yeah so he had no intention of giving her immunity or decreasing her sentence or not being harsh he yeah. was just trying to get her in custody she was charged with murder along with her sisters so of course with all this craziness it was an extremely sensational trial it began and many witnesses were called to testify to all this like evil bullshit that they had done mm-hmm you know, all the local criminals, townspeople, anyone, they were called in to be witnesses. When they were asked for an explanation for all these deaths and all the bodies, one of the sisters reportedly said the food didn't agree with them. What an <sighs> evil, evil, awful void of a person. Wow. Yeah, the food's not going to agree with you in jail either. Right? <laughs> Dozens of people testified about the rapes, the murders, and even Satanism. Girls testified that they were forced to practice sexual acts on animals and forced to participate, of course, in the torture and killing of other girls. Other people testified about the sisters corrupting and bribing local and state authorities. They were accounts of, of course, all the police officers and politicians being on their payroll and the kind of bribery that they were using, blackmail and all that. I'm surprised that went through. I wonder if anyone got, like, you know, politicians got 
right doubt out. it. Probably not. Yeah. yeah. Of course. The trial was chaotic and full of yelling on all sides. Their witnesses were yelling. The Gonzalez sisters were yelling and trying to defend themselves. Yeah. They were each sentenced to 40 years in prison. A lenient sentence, considering the amount of people. What? And, you know, the public really wanted them put to death. Yeah. But, yeah, 40 years. Um. Yeah. Not cool, bro. Delfina, the oldest, lost her mind in jail. She was afraid she was going to be murdered after taking the lives of all these girls. She knew that even in jail, there was enough people that wanted to kill them. Mm-hmm. On October 17th, 1968, she was screaming and ranting when workers looked over to see a bucket of cement dropping on her head from above. <laughs> and she thing. died of her injuries. That's a kind of easy way to go out, dude. Broken neck. Yeah, just one crack. Yeah. Yeah. Marie Luisa, or a.k.a. Eva the Leggy One, died alone in her cell in Irapatu Jail on November 19th, 1984. Her body was already being eaten by rats when it was discovered days after her death, which seems kind of fitting how they treated those girls. Don't feel bad at all. I know, right? Like, I, I'm i grossed out, but don't feel bad. No, and it also just reminds me of South Park every time Kenny dies. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Maria de Jesus, the youngest, she served her entire sentence and was eventually freed. What? She served 40 years and got out? Yes. Oh, my God. Yes. The rumor or the legend is that she met a 64, 64-year-old man in prison, and once they both were on the outside... They married and lived together in kind of this obscure existence. And they finally died of old age in the 1990s. So unfair. Yes. In 2002, workers were clearing land that was nearby the ranch (laughs) for a new housing community that was down the road from that Rancho El Angel, the bordello from hell. And they found gold deposits, right? Yeah. And everybody got rich and it was wonderful. And it was a good... Absolutely. Good. Yep. (laughs) So they found the remains of about 20 skeletons. So additionally, that brought the body count to well over 100. 100, Authorities said the victims were probably buried there in the 1950s or 1960s, which means that that would be the same time period. And most likely they were the victims of the Gonzalez sisters. It's, It's very unlikely that it was another you know murdering spree yeah that was going on at the same fucking time exactly you know guinness world records called the gonzalez sisters the most prolific murder partnership so if it's true it's the body count is over 110 people oh shit and that's not including you know unborn children oh man so that was a a fun story in air quotes was chill so i'm sorry that was so heavy it was you know what every once in a while that happens i feel i'm glad to know the story and fuck those women and it really bothers me that there's you know the one girl catalina that escaped we know her name yeah but it's so so tragic that none of these people have names it's you know i feel like lately i'm only calling back to old episodes but you remember the uh, one of the occult episodes we did where Adolfo Constanzo killed a bunch of locals throughout Mexico, but then it was only paid attention to when a white guy from the U.S. Yeah, was killed. Exactly. You know, and it's just like all these women just disappeared and no one gave a fuck. You know, someone had to actually escape that situation for it to be looked into. Yeah. You know, Kinda we like- have to assume that these families were reporting that their daughters were missing and nothing was happening. What the fuck? And we still don't know their identities. And I like dug around. I mean, it's like, I'm not, you know, the most experienced researcher, but it's not like I just read one article and I'm telling you about that one article. Like I'd fucking dug around and I couldn't find names of victims. Damn, Uh, It's just so tragic to me. They just disappeared, you know. But on the other hand, you know, a lot of them, you know, the ones that survived, I mean... Sometimes you don't want your name out there. You don't want your totally. the association of for the rest of your life. You are 
a sexual assault survivor in the fucking paper. Yeah. You know, like you need to have some healing from that and maybe not having your name out there is helpful to healing. I'm going to go with that. Yeah. I'm going to try and tell myself that so I can maybe sleep tonight, possibly, or maybe sometime in the next year I might sleep. Yeah. Yeah. My sleep's been really great since we started a murder podcast. I'm so happy. (laughs) I, you know what? You're glowing. (laughs) So that's going to be it for sisters. Yeah, man. Sisters are tough. It's, yeah, I'm ready to move on because this, this shit. They're bloody. Yeah. It's been so fucking sad. Women are crazy. (laughs) Oh, is that what it is? I mean, maybe not crazy, but we're just (laughs) like intense or whatever. Yeah. It takes a lot to get us to that point, but we do it. We do it up. We do well. (laughs) So yeah, that's sisters. Yeah. I was seriously singing that song like this whole time. Like sisters, every time I seem the word, I just you're you're the Tia to my Tamara. Aww. <laughs> so if you haven't followed us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, we would appreciate if you would go over there and you can get information about new episodes, bonus episodes what's going on on Patreon, what's going on with merch, mm-hmm. and, of course, some memes and information and general murdery craziness. It's just a fun time. It is you know? really good times. Yeah. And also, you know, a connection to a bunch of other listeners that always post the most awesome the shit. The coolest people ever. For it's Rose. fucking amazing. All the time I'm, like, getting all these new recommendations yeah. for things to watch, things to read, like seeing articles that I hadn't really seen before and yeah I'm going through there's that list of uh free documentaries on YouTube yes was it, was it Laura maybe maybe I'm not sure but somebody posted it because my brain doesn't work and then I started watching one called The Bridge oh yeah yeah I saw San that Francisco. in the article yeah the San Francisco gate I guess people jump off it a lot I didn't know and yep. it was intense the yeah. opening scene is a dude jumping off the fucking oh yeah man. I can't I because of my experience with with loved ones having yeah. mental health challenges. Yeah. I, I looked at that and I was like, that seems really intense and yeah. it's probably really well made, but there's no fucking way I could watch that. Yeah. I probably have a nervous breakdown. Shit. All right. You know? Well, there's like 19 <laughs> there's other so ones many on other there. One. No, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I don't mean to be like no, it's good negative though. Nancy, but that's just, it's way too it's heavy intense. for me. Yeah. Too close to home. Too soon. I'm really fascinated by like how calm people are before yes, it. Yes, I know. It's crazy. I know. They look like they want to do it, and then when that just it's just crazy. It's super intense. Yeah. Oops. So Good if you time. want more recommendations, yeah, well, give us more recommendations. Someone yes, just recommended that something on Netflix too. I think. Right? Mind Hunters. I didn't know what it was. Yeah. So. Is it good? Have you seen it? I have not, but I've heard a few people talk about it, and I'm all of a sudden, especially because people have recommended it on our page. Yeah. And then everybody jumps in, and they're like, "Yes, Mind yeah. Hunters." I'm like, "Okay." We were. T- I started confession tapes, which was like the first. Uh, the yeah. first one I did. It was pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Pretty good. I'm. People are stupid. Why don't ever commit? Don't ever. Yeah, you're like an advocate against confessions. Just don't confess. Like, just <laughs> blow her up. It makes me so mad. <laughs> Canada makes me mad too, but. It's okay. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. So if you want to check out those things, of course, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. What else? Our Patreon has mm-hmm. access to bonus episodes and merch and all sorts of stuff. Mm-hmm. So the link for our Patreon is going to be in the show notes and, of course, on our social media. We have merch from threadless.com slash murder dictionary. So that link is in there and on our, our Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all that good stuff. We've got phone cases woo, woo. and T-shirts, water bottles, coffee mugs, all that good shit yes. with our faces on it. Co- is it weird if I use a coffee mug? Like, I've already thought about that. I'm like, so I awkward. can't get these because I'm just going to feel weird. But yeah. the thing is, we've got two designs up there, the logo and the cartoon of us. Oh, and then perfect. we have two more coming Logo. that are mostly you know blood and knife focused cool so if you want that on you yeah then we got you so coming awesome. up in, in the next couple days i'm going to put out two more designs i'm so excited cool and what else resources for domestic violence mm-hmm. and child protective services and some mental health resources are going to be in the show notes and i think that's pretty much it Yay. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go watch some Mindhunters. Yes. 
<laughs> True crime and mind hunters and chill? Yes, please. And some food. Are you hungry? I'm fucking hungry. Yeah, yeah. let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Fall is here, and Old Navy's got all the styles you need right now, with up to 50% off store-wide. Hurry in for the season's biggest trends, like Rockstar jeans and frost-free jackets on sale. Jeans start at just 18 bucks for adults, 12 bucks for kids. Plus, get warm and stylish outerwear for just 18 bucks for adults, 17 bucks for kids. Want to save even more? Redeem your super cash now through Sunday. Hurry in now.